to see so many faces, so many familiar faces on. Um, I know last Borough Board was in person and that was that was exciting. I'm, I'm sad that I missed it, but looking forward to an opportunity to having Borough Board in person soon. Um, so we're gonna start pursuant to chapter four, section 85 and chapter 69, section 2706 of the New York City Charter, a joint meeting of the Bronx Borough Service Cabinet and Bronx Borough Board will take place today, Thursday, October 20th, starting uh, now, 10.05, virtually via WebEx. I'll begin with roll call. First up, we have our community boards, uh, CB1. Anna Roja, CB1. Good morning, Deputy. Good morning. Thank you, Anna. You're welcome. CB2. Good morning, Rafa Acevedo, District Manager. Good morning, Madam Deputy. Buenos dias, Rafael. Good morning. Buenos dias. CB3. Good morning, Etta Retta, Community Board 3, District Manager. Good morning, Retta. Great to see you. CB4. Robert Carmendez, Chair, CB4. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Mr. Chair. CB5. Good morning, Deputy Borough President, everybody. This is Ken Brown. I'm still the district manager of Community Board 5. Good morning, Ken. Great to see you. CB6. Good morning, all. Rafael Mode, district manager at Community Board 6. Good morning, Rafael. CB7. CB8. Good morning and happy Thursday, Laura Spalter, Chair, Community Board 8. Good morning, Kira Gannon, District Manager, CB8. Good morning, Madam Chair, and good morning, Sierra. Kiara. Great to see you. CB9. Good morning to everyone. Mohammed Majumdar, First Vice Chair, Community Board 9. Good morning, Shirley San Andres Alonso, Assistant District Manager, CB9. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, team. Good morning. CB10. Morning, Joe Russo, Chairman. Yeah, Joe. CB10. Good morning, Deputy. Uh, myself and Joe Russo are on from CB10. Thank you. Good morning, Matt. Good morning, Mr. Chair. CB11. Harriet Lasky, Staff, Community Board 11. Good morning. CB12. Good morning, everyone. Beatrice Coronel, Chair of CB12. Good morning, George, Community Board 12. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, George. Great to see you both. All right, moving along. Uh, City Council members, uh, the Honorable uh, Deputy Speaker, Diana Ayala, District 8. I am not her, but I am the Chief of Staff, Elsie Encarnacion. Great to be here. Welcome, Elsie. District 11, CM Dinowitz. District, District 12, CM Riley. Good morning, Madam Deputy Simone Jones, Chief of Staff for Council Member Riley. Good morning, all. Good morning, Simone. Great to see you. District 13, CM Velasquez. Good morning, everyone. This is Staff Constituent Liaison for Council Member Marjorie Velasquez. Good morning, Staff. District 14, CM Sanchez. Good morning, everyone. Sam, Chief of Staff for Council Member Pedina Sanchez here. Good morning. Good morning, Sam. District 15, CM Feliz. District 16, CM Stevens. Good morning, Sky Jackson from the Basketball Stevens team. And Terry Gensry is also on. Good morning, Sky. Good morning, team. District 17, CM Salamanca. Good morning, Madam Deputy. This is Shanna Knott, Deputy Chief of Staff for Council Member Salamanca. Good morning, Shanna. Great to hear from you. Yes. District 18, CM Farias. Good morning, Madam Deputy. It's Marco Luna, Director of Constituent Services for Council. Good morning, Marco. Great to have you. Um, and I see that we have a couple of uh, our city agencies on. Um, first off, I want to acknowledge the mayor's office of CAU, Alina Dow, who's on. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> good morning. I see the uh, city department of aging. 
Hi, good morning. This is Josue Melendez from the Department for the Aging. Good morning, Josue. I see uh, NYC DEP. Good morning. This is Effie Artizoni from DEP. Good morning, Effie. Uh, and I also see the OHMH is on. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Kenneth Johnson, community liaison to the Bronx. Thank you. Good morning, Kenneth. Uh, CCHR, I see Orlando is on. Hey, good morning. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, good morning, everyone. Orlando Torres here. Good morning, Orlando. And I also see the MTA is on. Good morning. Yes, thank you, Deputy Borough President. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. If I missed anyone, any other city agency, I know we have uh, some on our on our list uh, for presentations, but if I missed anyone, uh, oh, the OT is on. Yes, the OT is on. Yes, good morning. This is Soto, morning. Bronx DOT Commissioner's Office, and I'm joined by Kevin Perez, uh, also Bronx DOT Commissioner's Office. Wonderful, wonderful. Again, thank you all for joining us. We have a jam packed uh, and specifically intentionally tailored agenda for you all today. So we'll get right into it. First up, we have our um, first deputy chancellor, Melissa Ramos from the New York City Department of Education, um, giving us an overview and a presentation on the project open arms. So uh, Melissa, thank you so much for joining. I hand it over to you. Good morning, Madam Deputy, and thank you for the promotion, but I, I'm a senior executive director and I work for the first deputy chancellor. Um, <laughs> but it's listen, nice. sometimes we got to manifest it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. It's, it's a pleasure to be here with you all, um, uh, especially because I'm a Bronx girl, uh, live in Soundview. My daughter's a District 8 student, and so uh, I'm very happy to be here at home with all of you. This work is obviously very personal for all of us here, um, and we know that New York City Public Schools is one of many agencies that is stepping up and showing up as New Yorkers always do to support our um, newest New Yorkers. That being said, we know that um, even with the best intentions, we don't always get it right. Um, and so we know that uh, there's been a lot of feedback. We have our weekly briefings with our elected officials, um, which are coordinated um, by City Hall, and they've been very helpful. We also had recently um, a, a, a DOE briefing with all the elected officials to really talk about what is what are the efforts um, that we're doing on this end. And so a lot of that really includes um, looking across the existing systems that we have and strengthening them to support these students. So, for example, working with our students in temporary housing department, as well as our enrollment office and making sure that that coordination is strong. So a lot of questions come up about schools being overwhelmed with the influx of students. Some zone schools are becoming um, overwhelmed and they are reaching capacity. And so what we've done is work with superintendents to identify schools that do have available seats um, and that are reasonably distance from the shelter in the event that a zone school does um does reach capacity. These students are in temporary housing, and so under McKenney Vento, they have the right to attend their zone school, and we have to make sure that we are not creating travel hardships for them. That being said, if the school does reach capacity, um, and we do have to put them in schools that are slightly farther away from the shelter, we make sure that um, busing is provided, uh, metro cars are provided to the family, um, and, and we work in close contact with um, STH and enrollment to make all of that happen. Um, I want to say on this call that if anybody has any specific issues and escalations, um, please reach out to me. Um, I will leave my uh, phone number and my email um, in the chat and hopefully everybody will take advantage of that and contact me directly if there are any escalations. Because as the point person, I work with all of the superintendents and the chiefs of school support to make sure that if there is a need for additional funding, if 15 or more students are in a given grade and we need to open another section in that school, then we escalate that to our budget office and make sure that the money is in that budget that same week. In some cases, it has even landed in the budget the very next day. 
um, if the school has an English as a new language teacher and that teacher has reached capacity and is not able to service the additional students with the minutes that they need to meet um, compliance, then we also will escalate that to hire an additional teacher and get the money into the budget for that school to make personnel changes as soon as possible. So all those are logistical pieces, but we also know that we have to think about the social emotional support for these youngsters and their families. Many of these students have experienced great trauma. And so in some of our schools, we've seen buddy systems where students are paired up with um, other bilingual students who are supporting them. We are now in the process of working together with faith and thinking about how we can provide um, training at the at the local level um, and, and really empowering uh, the people on the superintendent's team who liaise with families and with our parent coordinators so that way they can um, facilitate and support um, workshops and meetings for these families. We also have something called the borough response teams and many of you have already Already responded to us, and we're thankful for that. Especially our borough president's office, um, working with um, Janiel Chacon and uh, Nelson Palacios. We are uh, launching these borough response teams to really coordinate in a cohesive manner the um, the donations and the drives that people want to host. Um, we don't want to take away people's individual. Uh, you know, autonomy and people want to hold their own drives and donations. That's wonderful. But we also know that sometimes people are well intentioned and they collect and then they don't know what to do with them. And so we want to make sure that it's getting into the right hands. So we did a couple of things. We created something called a donation management system, which Madam Deputy, I, I will share again with your office. Um, but these forms are very simple. Um, if you want to donate, you fill out a form and you let us know what it is that you're looking to donate, how much of it. Um, and if you are requesting a donation, you fill that out and, talk, and, and tell us specifically what it is that you're requesting. Our central um, students and temporary housing team is looking at this as a dashboard and we're connecting these resources with schools and shelters as these donations come up. And then finally, on November 5th, um, thanks to the um, generosity of Principal Luis Torres in District 9, PS55, we are hosting a massive um, giveaway where we are going to have um, face painting and a DJ and bouncy house and really celebrate um, with our new families and the community community, but they will come into what he calls the bodega and they will be able to take food and clothing and other resources. Um, and, and we're going to do this on an ongoing, maybe not necessarily always from PS55, but it's an ongoing effort. We are also working um, with some of our partners who are restaurant owners to secure storage. So that way, as donations come in, we can um, leave them in, in storage spaces and hold these um, regular drives um, and, and what we're calling festivals, because it's very important to maintain dignity so we don't want to say hey we just want to give you these resources we just want to donate to you we want people to have that dignity and feel like this is a community event know that this is a community event and that we we're here to support them so i've said a lot and and uh, i apologize because we also had technical difficulties so i like ran down the stairs so i can use maisha's computer so i apologize if this is all like uh i'm speaking a, a, a mile a minute but i'm i'm here i don't know what the q a portion is like but i will leave information in the chat and Madam Deputy, I will follow up with your office, which is always um, super responsive and supportive of this work. So thank you to you and, and Borough President Gibson. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melissa. I think it will be helpful if, if we can define um, Project Open Arms for folks who may not be familiar with the initiative. Of course, and so when in in July, when we started seeing the greatest influx, um, we met with City Hall and City Hall um, was like, we need a plan. Like, what is this plan to receive students to ensure that they're enrolled, to ensure, ensure that they are supported at the school level, um, that they have the resources that, that, that they need and that there's interagency collaboration. And so the mayor and the chancellor um, named it Project Open Arms, as in we are welcoming all new, all our newest New York workers with open arms um, and, and we are going to make sure they have the resources that they need. So all the pieces that I just spoke about are all under the Project Open Arms Initiative. Um, I am the point person for New York City Public Schools and, and, and again, my job is to coordinate across divisions and departments to make sure that existing structures are addressing the need um, of, of these students and these families and also working with the other agencies. Um, so DHS, right? Like whatever happens in DHS is going to affect us because when as the shelters open that means new students are going to be enrolled in in, in different parts of our school system um so so that is why we called it project open arms 
super helpful. So I'll open it up for questions. Because I know this is in uh, some challenging times that we're as a as a as a borough, right? As a city, but um, primarily as a borough, all of our community boards and elected officials have been working hand in hand to ensure that we can harness the the necessary resources to welcome our new New Yorkers. So I'll open it up to the board to ask any questions. And just a quick reminder, anyone who's on WebEx, either on a computer, smartphone, tablet, you can use the raise hand function with the button on your screen. I do see we have one person who's connected by phone only. Uh, so to that person, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine on your phone if you'd like to. But deputy, I do not see any hands raised at this time. All right. Um, well, I have a quick question, Melissa. What, in addition to um, the public schools and educational support, what other resources are being provided to parents through this initiative, if any? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. So um, we are working with our temporary housing a team to create um, resource packets that are translated in multiple languages and, and, and allow families to know what are the resources that they're entitled to, regardless of status? Again, we don't ask families their status. We are really tracking um, these families based on their temporary housing status and new admit to public uh, public city schools um, since July 2nd. That's how we're tracking data. Um, but we want to make sure that we're providing them um, we're counseling them on what resources are available to them. So part of these um, these fairs that we're having, these festivals, we also want to invite um, partners to come and speak to the families about what they're entitled to. Um, additionally, we know that um, workshops are going to be very important, how we can create um, programs to support families with learning English. These are all things that we're exploring now. They're all in their infancy. Um, and again, if anybody has any feedback for us on ideas and want to partner with us, we are super happy um, to have partners in this work. But we're in the very early stages of, of this, and 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 those are our priorities right now. Thank you so much. And and being that it's in the early stage, it really gives us an opportunity to pivot and re-strategize accordingly. Um, I I think I I saw a hand from uh, District Nine. Hi, yes, good morning. I apologize if I missed this, but I'm just interested in knowing how the resources are allocated. Are we making a request through our superintendent? Is this happening automatically without requests being made? Um, how, do, how do you figure out which schools get the resources? That's a great question. So I'm going to share um, the uh, donation management system. Um, if, if you're saying resources, do you mean like donations or do you mean um, fair suit, the funding for en uh, enrollment increases? I just want to be clear on how we define resources. Right. So like the funding for schools or like hiring a new uh, ENL teacher. Great. So schools will then um, escalate that to their superintendents and the superintendent team. Uh, the superintendents usually are able to make those make those budget adjustments happen at the local level. Sometimes if there is any confusion or quite frankly, any red tape, the superintendent then calls me and says, this is this is an escalation that needs to happen because these students we have 30 additional students in temporary housing. And here's the here's the piece, right? Like. It, if you get 30 additional kids, even if they're scattered all over the building, you may need an additional ENL teacher. So if that ENL teacher needs to be there, then that and and you're having trouble hiring that person or vetting candidates, then we step in. So it starts with the superintendent. You know, the superintendents know their schools very well, and we want to be respectful of that process. But I'm here as an extra support, and uh, I guess like a like a noise maker. So if something's if something's going wrong, it's like, hey, we need to pay attention to the school type of thing. Um, but the superintendents all have my number. They contact me all the time, as well as the elected officials. I really want to stress that sometimes elected officials hear things from the community. And um, if you many of them go directly to me as opposed to the superintendent, you can go to the superintendent if you have that relationship with the superintendent and you know who they are. If you don't who they know who they are, you have me. Um, and so you would reach out to me and let me know and say, hey, in district, whatever is having this issue I'm hearing about this can you investigate and get back to me we do that all the time here 
Thank you. And Deputy, I saw we had another hand raised. Etta Ritter. Hi, thank you for that. So my question is um, for the November 5th event, um, PS 55 is located within community district three. Um, I'm just hearing about this event and I would want to know how the community board and the residents can support this event. You know, uh, is there any flyers available? You know, what can we do? So principal help? Torres and I uh, designed a flyer around uh, 9 30 PM last night. <laughs> so he and I have a call after this. So that way we can um, blast because we know that we both have overlapping um, distribution list. So I apologize in advance if you get that flyer twice, but we are going to do a blast this morning um, and I will I will share it also with um, the borough president's office. They were instrumental in helping us launch this, so it would only be right for us to share it here. But yes, there is a flyer and we have designated days to drop off donations to the school as well as to be present at the event if you're if 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 you're able to join. I appreciate that. Yes, because I would like to let my um, education chair know. Again, we just had our meeting this morning at nine. So it, it was people from our community school district 12 and eight, and they would have, you know, liked to appreciate it, this information as well. So I thank you so much for that. And I look forward to receiving the flyer. And we'll resend as well. So you'll get oh, it three times. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's, it's good. The more the merrier. I see Orlando's hand is raised. Yes, thank you. Um, Melissa, thanks so much for this presentation. It's great to get to know um, the, you know, the program and be connected to you. I just wanted to um, offer you know, Commission on Human Rights as a referral service for families, students that may be coming to Project Open Arms and having problems with like potential discrimination, whether in school, at work, uh, looking for housing. If they have an address in New York, if they work in New York, they're covered under the human rights law and they should um, be calling our info line number and making their voice heard with us. Um, I will leave that number in the chat as well as my contact info, but please feel free to reach out to me um, for any questions about that or anything you might Definitely think Definitely be reaching out to you offline. Awesome. Definitely. Thanks. Beautiful. Teamwork makes the dream work. Um, Melissa, I had a final question if no one else has a question for Melissa, I'm trying to look through. Chris, let me know if I'm missing anyone. Okay. Nope. Um, uh, I, I don't see any other hands raised. Got it. Um, Melissa, and I know that this is, you know, a situation that's constantly sh changing and, um, and, and, you know, the administration has been doing everything in their power to ensure that they're nimble in, in um, how, you know, we respond. But uh, considering, uh, you know, the, the younger students um, that are, you know, that already are, are carrying trauma. Um, what, what is the DOE doing to ensure, you know, when folks are relocated to other sites? Because it happens often from the Bronx and over to Queens and Manhattan, et cetera. Um, what is the DOE doing or is there a, 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 a different initiative that ensures the continuation of learning for for our new students and uh, kind of minimizes disruption for them? That's an excellent question. So I feel like the response is going, if I'm understanding all of your question, it's mm -hmm. a combination of logistics and ongoing support, right? And so one of the things is we wanna make sure that families are moved as minimally as possible. And so to give you an example, even with the family Herc opening at the row, we will have enrollment and temporary housing folks there to really work with case managers in identifying the most permanent place for these families before we enroll, so we can enroll students thoughtfully right there will be no lag time like if students if, if these families are are here and they're in their their intention is to stay then we are going to enroll them but we want to make sure that we're not enrolling them in a school in manhattan when they have intentions of moving to queens right and so we want to be really intentional and really partner with families and have those conversations with caseworkers to make sure that we're minimizing that that being said we know that these are families in transition and that some some of the trans some some transition will happen and so a couple of things 
we know that in, in one case, one family said, listen, I know that I'm going to another another borough, but I want to stay in this in this school because I really love the school. My kids are comfortable here and there's a possibility I'll be back because I have family that will be able to take me in in a couple of months. Can you please help me? So we counseled the family and we're arranging for busing. We let the family know, unfortunately, this is a hardship now where your child who's only five years old is going to be the first to be picked up and the last to be dropped off. But if this is what you think is best for your family, we're going to support you. And we're going to make sure that the busing happens, right? So there's that piece. The second piece is we need to make sure that we are expanding our bilingual mental health um, providers. And we know that the, thank, thankfully, because of all the work that our elected officials do, we have more social workers than ever. And I, I guess it's a, you know, it's a little sore spot for me because when I was a principal, I could not afford a social worker. So I was so excited when I saw the good work that all the elected officials did because small schools shouldn't have to pay for being small and not be able to afford access to mental health workers. And so right now, um, the chancellor and a team of us are really talking about how we can um, bring back even people who were retired. So we're doing a call to action so that way we can really ask our retired um, bilingual school counselors and social workers um, to please come back and to support, even if it's on a, a, a temporary basis. And of course, actively recruiting, working with university partners um, and thinking about how we can expand our pipeline. That being said, we do have social workers. We have our Bridging the Gap social workers. And in some cases, what we've done is we've reassigned some of our SOAP uh, so, social worker supervisors on a temporary basis to different schools that have seen the greatest influx. So that way we can do a capacity building model. Which counselors do you have? What social worker do you have? Let's put a plan in place so that way we know how we're going to support these kids. I can't I cannot undermine the importance of professional development. I know it's some, it's a buzzword that you know us educrats say all the time, and, and it makes people roll their eyes. But there's a difference between the way professional development has been rolled out in the past versus the vision of professional development for this administration. We believe in job embedded support. We believe in shoulder to shoulder training. So if we have to go to a school and visit classrooms and give you feedback on lesson plans and show you how lesson planning is done, we're ready to do that. We have sample lessons on how you can plan for students with trauma and how you can plan for students who are learning English as a new language. We don't like to say second language because that assumes that these students are coming here speaking only one language. And in many cases, these students are not monolingual. The other piece of this is how do we train our folks around sensitivity and balancing sensitivity with high expectations. What we don't want to do is lower expectations for our youngsters and believe that they cannot achieve great things, but we also need to be sensitive. So that is also part of the professional development that we're rolling out. How do we visit schools and see what's happening, share best practices and support those that are struggling with this because not everybody does this work the same way. And so that on the ground training is going to be really, um, really Im important um, to help to arming all of our educators, not just creating this task force of people who can support the traumatized children, but how do we make it something that all of us um, are able to do? Wonderful, that's great to hear. And I bring it up uh, because this earlier this week, I went to visit PS5 um, and and I uh, had the, the privilege of seeing kind of how the students are really blending in very, very well. Um, there's a thing or two that we can learn from, from you know, the younger generation, from the first and second graders, where they are completely welcoming and, and you know, uh, they're they're uh, just blending very well as as a unit. Um, but we actually have a listening session with Principal Keen, Danielle Keen, today. She's oh, going to be wonderful. with the chancellor, and we're pulling in all the principals who have seen the greatest influx and who are doing really great things because we want to not showcase them just because they're wonderful, but also right. have other schools learn from them. So it's so funny that you mentioned PS5 because Danielle is one of our best. Yes, and we we had a, an extensive conversation, and one of the pieces that that came up was just that trans, you know, that folks are in transitional housing, and and you know, many parents are still traveling from Queens to you know ensure that there's no additional disruption to the learning of their child because they they really love it. Here and so I just want to ensure that you know the DOE is aware. I'm sure she's going to give you more feedback, so I won't I won't bog you down on that. Um, but that's that's truly really important to us to ensure that there's a, con a continuation and uh, 
minimize the disruption of learning for for um and as these members. issues come up if they come to your offices please let us know please 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 email call me text okay. me anything that works um for you as these issues come up like i said we we're not perfect we know that we need to address where we need to get better so if you hear of of issues amongst your constituents please please reach out wonderful and i see uh george your hand is raised thank yeah. you um so my question is, and I think you you spoke about this a little bit, Melissa, but I just wanted to clarify or want you to clarify. Are the services that were provided to the migrant, the migrant families being extended to the whole school family, especially native New Yorkers? For example, we have native New Yorkers that are in shelters. Um, I hear complaints from my constituents all the time who happen to be in shelters that, you know, there was an article in the post, as a matter of fact, this morning. Uh, highlighting, you know, the discrepancies between uh, the shelter on that's literally 25 yards away from the tent city. So I'm just wondering, are these like the services that you're providing for the migrant family? Is that funding set aside just for them, or is that something that's extended to the whole school? For example, if you have a busing issue, are these kids also being, you know, native New Yorkers being bused that have challenges and stuff like that? That for the services. Thank you for that really important question. Um, so again, we're not tracking students by um, citizenship, by status. We're looking at students in temporary housing. And so anything that we are doing to support students in temporary housing goes to every student in temporary housing. Now, what you bring up speaks to some gaps in the way that we pay attention to this this popu these popul this population of students, right? And so I think that this is an opportunity for us to see how we can be better in, in, within our own agency, but also across agencies, right? And I think that this has brought about some really powerful collaboration that isn't um, a fad, as someone told me. And they're like, oh, because, you know, we're talking about asylum seekers. We're talking about students in temporary housing. And the work that we're doing to support students in temporary housing isn't going to stop, even if we stop talking about quote unquote asylum seekers, even though we've been, we, we've been serving families coming from other countries forever. Um, it's just that it's it, the numbers have, have, resulted in massive attention. Um, the final thing I'll say is in terms of funding, funding is attached to enrollment. So you don't get additional, we're not giving them additional money right now for um, asylum seeking students. We're giving them money when the school has reached a certain capacity and can no longer function with the money that's in their budget and they need to open another classroom. So in some cases that may be over the counter students who are not in temporary housing and those schools are going to lift that as a concern and say, hey, I have to open another section because you guys gave me 20 new students and I don't have enough teachers and they work with the superintendent. The only reason why it gets escalated to me if it's students in temporary housing is because we need to make sure that we're also looking at the ENL component because we know many of these students will become most will most likely be uh, multilingual learners. And so if the school has an ENL teacher or a bilingual teacher and they also need an additional teacher, we need to escalate that and make sure that we're hiring those people ASAP. They're not easy to find and it's already middle of this first semester. All right, thank you. Great, thank you. I see Ralph, your hand is raised. Thank you, Madam Deputy. Uh, Ms. Ramos, great presentation on your project here, this open arms. I just wanna piggyback off of George's point. I think he raises a good point because besides uh, shelter, shelter folks and um, these asylums, they're technically, you, we're calling them temporary, but the majority of them are gonna turn permanent. And my concern has always been regarding the school construction authority and potential sites. I, I feel that in my district, in particular, um, community board two and in school district eight, there's always, I, I, I don't see it as discrepancies, but there's always on one side, you know, um, we're at capacity. Mr. Acevedo, weren't you and I on an email just now about yes. this? Yes, we yes. were. Yes, and that's why I have to put my plug in for this now. And I just actually sent you another email stating this, but I want to just always bring it to people's attention. You know, we had our budget consultations with DOE and School Construction Authority. In my district in particular, they're saying, as of right now, DOE is saying that there's um, capacity for more students, but yet the school construction authority is saying, oh, within the five or 10 years, five or 10 years, we're going to need an additional 500 seats. 
I know I'm getting uh, an influx of apartments, affordable housing, about 1,200 in particular. I need to start thinking long term here and getting the school construction authority on board that, hey, in a couple of years from now, not only in my district, uh, my, my community board for my school district, we're going to be over capacity. And even you started out your presentation by saying that we need to make sure that kids remain in their zone schools. We don't want kids traveling. So I'm in Hunts Point. School District 8 goes up to Pelham Bay. So they're going to tell me that there's a uh, capacity in school district eight and I got to get kids bus from Hunts Point to Pelham Bay. I don't think that's fair to my district and the residents in my district. So I'm always going to advocate that the school construction authority, um, you know, do their job, do their due diligence and looking at potential sites. And, um, you know, I know in my district also, we haven't had reconstruction or a new school in quite some time. And, you know, we're getting an influx of affordable housing here. And I just want to put that plug in and make sure that what I'm saying is I hope no other board is going to be going through because I'm going through this now. And even though it's not affecting me today, two, three, five years from now, it will be. And that's where my concern is. But that, thank you, Ms. Ramos. I appreciate well, Mr. Acevedo, it's good to It's good to put a face to the name. Um, and I will reach out to SCA and inquire further um, about their response. I will be honest because I don't like to over-promise and under-deliver. Um, it's not my wheelhouse, but I will have a conversation with them, and then I'll contact you so we can speak more offline. Especially because I, Toby is a good, Mr. Perez is a good friend of mine. We will have to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank uh, you so much. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, sorry, Deputy. I was just going to say we've got a couple more hands that have, that have gone up. Uh, Etta had her hand up again. Or actually, no, sorry, Ken had his hand up again first. Ken, if you're there. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, can you can you please speak to any monies that have been promised, delivered, or requested, or resources in general to the federal government? Um, I cannot speak to I cannot speak to the financial part, the federal funding right now outside of the enrollment piece. Um, I do have meetings with our budget team later on because a number of questions are coming up about budget. And so more information will be released and I will make sure that I share it um, with the borough president's office. But what I can tell you is that as schools enroll, we make sure that we provide them the um, the funding that's tied to enrollment so they can hire additional teachers as soon as possible. Thank you, Ken. Edda? Okay, I'm back again. <clears throat> Just a quick question. So, because you're, you know, once the school gets to a certain capacity and then you can hire, they can be given money to hire um, a teacher, extra teachers. Now, how does that affect those children that have IEPs? Is there any money set aside? Because some of these kids may need an IEP. So, are, uh, is money going to be set aside for that? Because IEPs, they, you know, they take a while to even receive the services. So because of this influx, is there going to be a different way that IEPs are being dealt with? Because I know people, parents, that have children that have taken IEPs, and it takes them like half the year to get the services. So are you addressing also addressing that fact as well to maybe, you know, make it a shorter time frame when parents can receive services for their children who have IEPs? So as as we continue to monitor schools, it's through the lens of students in temporary housing. So all facets of that. So as we look at students in temporary housing, we know who those students are and we say, okay, so Melissa has now, there's a referral, there's an open referral for Melissa to be evaluated. If she does come back needing an IEP, we need to get her her services. So we need to make sure that Melissa is evaluated quickly. So we are working with our superintendent team to monitor the students in temporary housing population because we know that that is a, a, a population that we must pay close attention to, particularly because of the movement. So for example, I may be in District 8 today, but what happens if I move and now I opt to be transferred and I now reside in District 11? We need to make sure that we're keeping careful tabs on that evaluation 
foundation so that way everything continues when the student goes to the uh, if the student goes to another school so in terms of funding there are two different um, deadlines schools are by 1031 um, there we look at register growth so if you got additional students beyond what you were projected to receive by 1031 um, then that's that's one deadline we and 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 we provide funding now in most cases that funding gets provided later on in the year but we are escalating because we know see, these numbers are, are pretty big and so uh, fam schools are getting their money way in advance of that 1031 deadline the second deadline is for students with ieps so that happens in december so as we continue to monitor that number schools will receive the funding that they're entitled to for students who have ieps we are not we are not imagining that all of these students are going to have IEPs. We want to follow the process and we want to make sure that as they're evaluated, if they need services, we're going to provide them the services. But there is no additional funding for students with IEPs if they have not been identified as needing an IEP. And so that second deadline happens um, around December. Okay, so the way I just want to make sure I understand um, what you just said to me. So you're saying that the IEPs, if if you if you the migrants who are coming into the school system, if they are requesting an IEP, if they're they requesting to be evaluated, evaluated to get an IEP, they'll get that service, and you'll try to provide the services that they need. But other students who are not part of the temporary being temporary housed, they they have to wait. All students, so all schools have a case manager. They have their, their school-based team, mm -hmm. and they know that they have a timeline that they have to adhere to to get students evaluated. All we're doing is looking at the students in temporary housing and making sure that they don't get lost in case they are in transition. So, for example, if I'm in temporary housing and I'm in a school in District 9 today, if I transfer shelters, I have the right to stay in that District 9 school, but I also have the right to transfer to another school and to be bused. So if I'm transferred to that other school, I want to make sure that Melissa is not lost in that evaluation process. Because gotcha. so that's why we pay such close attention to the temporary housing piece, not because they're migrant students, not because because in any student to Mr. Torres's point in temporary housing, we have to make sure that we are watching the student because they are in such transition. That doesn't mean that any other student who is waiting for an evaluation or who has an IEP takes us back seat to them. And again, this is an area where we need to improve. Some schools and some school based teams do it better than others. This is where the superintendents are holding principals accountable and us as a system have to hold each other accountable. But from my purview, we're looking at the students in temporary housing and making sure, hey, if Melissa's in the school now Melissa transfers did Melissa's evaluation finish does right. Melissa have an IP was it written is it still in draft right. is, does the new school have access to it those are important pieces because that's why that population can sometimes be neglected if we don't pay close attention to their movement okay thank you I appreciate that to know thank you so much Melissa and Etta for your question we're, we'll take one more question since we're uh, tight on time, and and I believe Rafael, you had your your hand raised. Thank you. Yes, I just wanted to echo um, the concern that Ralph Acevedo had. Um, we had a large rezoning in Community Ward Six, and as part of the rezoning, um, SCA committed to building a new school um, in anticipation of sixteen hundred units of housing coming online. Um, but I'm now hearing the SCA has backed out and is not taking up the option to construct a school in District Twelve, where there's already middle school overcrowding. So I was wondering if you could help connect me to someone at ACA, at SCA to talk about this. Um, I've been kind of talking through city planning and I was hoping that you could maybe connect me with someone to better understand what's happening. Yes, there is a process and I believe the person's name is Kelly Murphy who worked with Mr. Acevedo and me. Um, if you could just email me separately so that way I can, can e-connect you with that person, I'll make that connection today. Thank you. Wonderful. And Melissa, we held you up for close to an hour. We're truly grateful. Thank you again for prioritizing our meeting this morning and, and you know, sharing so much insight. Um, I believe, yes, Melissa, you shared your contact information via the chat. Everyone that's on, please take advantage. Uh, we, you know, uh, Melissa has been super supportive and working closely with our office and 
extremely respons responsive. So we're super grateful for you, Melissa. Thank you for the hard work. Thank you to the DOE team that's making it happen behind the scenes. Thank you. Looking I just want to leave with two really quick things. One, again, we can't address what we don't know. Hold us accountable. Ask those questions. If I don't have answers, like I don't have the answers right now for the budget piece, and I'm not going to make one up. Um, I. You ask the questions, I get you the answers. We we address the issue. So please continue to reach out and hold us accountable. And the second thing is, I just want to thank you all for your leadership. It's an honor to be home um, amongst all of you. Um, this is this is the family that I want raising my child, the family that raised me, and nobody does it like the Bronx. So I just want to thank you all for having me and have a that's right, that's right. Have a great that's day, right. and we'll be in touch. Well, welcome home, and and it's great to know that we have you know, an ally at, at the OE that we can count on. So thank you. Thank you again, Melissa. Um, and you're day. always welcome to come to our borough board. So <laughs> feel free. I will. Thank, thank you. you so much. Have a great one. Bye. Thank you. Take care. All righty. So up next, we have um, Kemela Arroyo, Chief Accessibility Officer from the Metropolitan, from the MTA, um, who will provide us with an overview on accessibility initiatives. So Kemela, I hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Dana. And it's so good to see you. Same. And it's so good to be Look at you. you. And, How and, are you? So I'm great good. to have Thank you. you. It's a it's a really a pleasure to be in conversation with with, with my, my fellow peeps from the Bronx. Uh, um I, I am, as you said, the chief accessibility officer here at the MTA. And, and really we wanted a chance to to come and talk to you all about all the exciting things happening here at the MTA for accessibility, not only in Manhattan across the city, but in the Bronx specifically. Uh, so, so thank you for that. And if I can, let me share our presentation. Uh, can you just confirm that you see that presentation now? No, not yet. Uh, does, does he have, there we go. Okay, perfect. Wonderful. So, uh, accessibility at work. First and foremost, I, I'm really excited to, to share with you all, to those of you who have been, might have not heard yet, we have a new pilot here at, at the MTA. Um, after many conversations with parents, caregivers, and, and folks who use strollers, we, we have started a pilot to look at what it could look like for our community members to access our bus systems with an open stroller. Right now, as you all know, the policy requires parents and caregivers to fold the stroller before boarding our buses, and, and we have an active pilot that is live. Um, we have bus routes in all five boroughs, including the Bronx, where, where parents and caregivers can now enter, as you see here, with an open stroller and uh, park that stroller at a designated space for an open stroller that is separate from the access accessible parking, uh, um, accessible designated areas for persons with disabilities. And as you see here, that's myself on the on the right here uh, uh, on a bus and a parent coming in with a stroller. No conflict at all. Of course, maintaining the integrity of the accessibility uh, accessibility space was a, a priority for us. In the Bronx, we, we've designated the BX23 and Q50, mainly because those two routes share a bus fleet. And, and in all the boroughs, all the routes that we selected, we selected for many reasons, one of them being we wanted to ensure that that entire fleet that services those routes would be able to be retrofitted and be part of those 142 buses that we've retrofitted and have on the road now for this pilot. Um, so, so, so that's the route in the Bronx. We'll, we'll be doing more outreach or around DOE facilities, pre-K programs around the bus sites, but we wanted you all to know and hear from us that this is active and we'd love to hear feedback right now. We, we came up with this pilot with our operators, our union, parents, members of the disability community, caregivers, and, and now we want to hear from you all. So, so we're all ears and we're really excited about th this change. When I first came to the MTA, one of the things that I said was that my definition of accessibility is quite broad and, and it spans far beyond just disabilities. I don't believe that accessibility is analogous to disabilities. It includes, in my opinion, parents, caregivers, our aging New Yorkers, and of course, tourists, um, who, who are moving around with luggage, and, and this is what it looks like, right? This pilot is making our bus systems more accessible for for parents and caregivers. So, so that's the first project that that I, I'd like to talk to you about and, and bring to your attention. Secondly, uh, uh, quite some time now after I arrived, I 
notice that a big impediment to the circulation and in, in, into our system to accessing our our subway systems was the fact that we had 33,000 customers with the exclusive right to enter our systems through our auto gate, what we call here, which is our which are automated gate, and we have about 200 of these throughout the system that open at them automatically for someone who has that special card like I did. And I know that access was needed for far more people than just those 33,000 people that who had a specialized Metro card. We have now opened up the auto gate and make them available and accessible to everyone. You can either dip your Metro card or tap an Omni card or whatever payment form you have nowadays to open these gates for whatever need you have, whether you're a parent with a stroller or a caregiver, a person with a bike or some luggage, or, 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 or you, you know, you have a guitar or whatever precludes you from coming through the turnstile. We want to open up the system because we know that you, know, you want to get around and you need access to. Many New Yorkers need access to much more than those 33,000 that used to have those exclusive Metro cards. So we've opened up the system and, and again, We've opened up these doors to expand the definition of accessibility, getting through the fair payment system. So we hope that you're all seeing this in your community, that you're utilizing it, and, and that those who need it are going through those gates. We are currently we're working to continue to iterate what access looks like, physical access looks like. My, my team and I and others here at the MTA are embarking on a redesign of what accessibility at the fair rate looks like. And we, we should have some exciting news in the coming months. So, so we'll be back to present more uh, on physical access in our subway stations. We, working with our disability advocates, have come to an agreement on really how to find what accessibility is going to look like at the MTA long term. We have a settlement that is a landmark settlement uh, in the United States, an investment of a minimum of $30 billion have been earmarked for accessibility, spending a floor uh, of a billion dollar a year for the next 30 years to get to, we say 95%, at least 95% accessibility throughout the system. And, and that is huge, right? No other transit system in the world has made this commitment to accessibility. We have the Otis system in the world. Uh, um, we're about to turn 110 years old. So, so retrofitting is a lot of what we do to make uh, our, a lot of our legacy stations accessible. And this commitment it was really an amazing, amazing outcome after years of conversation with disability advocates and, and many here at the MTA. And we are so proud for this commitment. Gone are the days of arguing what the MTA is doing on accessibility. We now have a plan that is public and we want to tell you more about that plan and those specifics. So right now, our transit system is fairly accessible. We have 140 stations that are fully accessible throughout our network, and that's about 30% of the system, so a long way to go, and we know that. But you heard me say already that accessibility is quite broad for me. In my definition, it, it is a lot more than just elevators and ramps. It includes, of course, an accessible boarding area that is leveled, so that there are no trip hazards and people can easily walk or roll onto our, 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 our trains. We have tactile warning strips that we are enhancing and continuing to install throughout the system. So for those of you who tune in to our MTA board meetings and committee meetings, you hear me announcing every month what tactile warning strips we've been installing at stations that didn't have it before. I'm sorry, can I... Blind. There we go. And of course, here you were muted we're for a little bit. I'm sorry. If you can just, sorry? you were muted for a little bit. If you can just re reiterate that, the last okay. two points. We we lost you there. Yes. And and of course, hearing loops, and added access point for for those customers who need it. We are very busy in this capital plan. This capital plan that we have right now includes the largest investment and stations for accessibility than any other plan before. And, and we'd like to talk to you a little bit about what it what it calls out. In this current capital plan, we've named 70 stations to be made accessible throughout the five boroughs. And that includes the Bronx. Um, we, we have not let COVID stop us, actually quite the contrary. During COVID, we, we brought 
11 elevators live and, and throughout the system. And, and we have been really busy designing more access. So far you have here in this page of what the construction phase looks like in this capital plan already. We have five stations uh, um, that are currently in construction, three stations that were fully constructed and about seven stations that are called out in this capital plan to be constructed later on um, as we continue to roll through this capital plan. I will say that, that here at the MTA, my colleagues and I at HQ are all extremely busy speaking to our elected officials in, in Albany, our the city council par partners, because we have a huge hole in our capital plan right now, about $2.5 billion deficit that we're really looking to fill so that we can continue working on these stations that, that I'm calling out here in, in, that are remaining in the capital plan. Uh, um, we have about seven in the Bronx that, that, that we'd like to get to and want to continue to work on. Uh, um, but we're, right now we're focusing on leaning on all, all of our partners and our overlords to make sure that our capital plan uh, is funded to full capacity so that we can continue to work and execute on these promises for the Bronx, for New Yorkers to continue to enhance accessibility. Um, so, so that was a lot of information, a lot of fun new stuff that we have going on. Um, and that's what I wanted to present today. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'll open it, I'll open it up for questions. Ty, you're up first. Hey, how you doing? Tyree Kesserow, Council Member Stevens Office. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, how were the first ADA stations uh, chosen? Like, were there like uh, what data went into that when you when the MTA decided they were going to choose the first set of stations uh, specifically in the Bronx? Well, the first set of stations that were, that, that were installed were part of what was called the 100 Key Station Program, and, and you know, former. Uh, Governor Cuomo, Mario Cuomo started that uh, program. So those 100, we are about to wrap up on that program. Beyond that, the ones that you see coming on today and the selections of the stations that we have in this capital plan are part of a criteria uh, that are public that we worked on with the community, particularly our disability community advocates to ensure that you know, our criteria met what they wanted to see. So right now we're working on criteria that look at volume that look at necessity and that look at coverage system wide coverage to ensure that there is equity in how we are bringing those elevators up to live. So those criteria again are come up are constructed with the advocates and the MTA. Um, and yeah, my final question. Um, so where are the plan for the residents? Um, for example, uh, I get to see the 170 station every day. Um, and I also get to frequently hear some of the groans from the 170 train station when the elevator goes out, which is frequent. Um, so what are the plans for the residents who um, need that access? Um, because what I'm finding is a lot of them take the train to 161st and roll or walk or whatever they do to where they have to go from 161st Street. Um, and I also know that we have a few bus stops that are moved and, for example, the uh, the Q, um, the Q50, and the BX23. Um, what happens when those bus stops are moved? Those are already like transportation deserts. So, how are these people getting access to the, the to these systems? Well, I, I think that's a multi-layered question. The first part is we are uh, we try to be as transparent and provide real-time information to all of our customers uh, online, uh, um, showing what elevators are in service and and, and when. We have to take down elevators either for normal replacement when we're doing maintenance work, replacing elevators, and or when elevators go out. So, so we do have that information, which is pretty close to real time uh, uh, on our website. To your second question about the movement of bus stops in particular, we, we have rolled out a, a successful re bus redesign in the Bronx. We engaged with the community extensively uh, on what those plans were going to be. Those plans were redesigned, reiterated several times after conversations with the community. But I understand that stations that get moved are going to cause some issues for some some customers, right? We we are doing this to streamline 
our bus routes to make bus speeds faster and to get residents of the Bronx and, and New Yorkers where they want to go much faster. Notwithstanding, people will be impacted, right? A and that means that people are going to have to learn a new route, maybe have to walk a block or two to, to find a new bus stop. But again, this is done not in a vacuum in conjunction with our all of our elected officials and of course extensive public outreach. So the community knows what was going to happen, they saw it happening, and they knew what to expect. I'm sorry, just a quick follow-up. So you said that you did a community outreach would like were those held were those community outreach held at the uh, local committee boards where they put through the elected official offices? Can you can you speak more to that? Both. Yeah. So so our our, our public outreach uh, team was really busy and, and continues to be. We we now have other boroughs that we're doing a redesign for, and, and it it, in, it includes all, all of the above that you just mentioned. Thank you, Terry. And I I believe Sam, you had your hand raised. Terry got to my questions first, so we're good. Ken. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Borough President. Um, in in the uh, towards the end of the presentation, thank you, um, Mr. Arroyo. You said that there were a number of stations in the capital plan. Could you please drill down what that means, particularly, and is there a schedule? And of course, uh, I'm most interested in the uh, the work that's going to go into the number four at Burnside. That's been a concern and an ask for the community since time immemorial. Yeah, uh, ha happy to, um, Ken. So, so I said, and I, and I had a visual that we recently completed work at three stations in the Bronx that, that we've now made accessible and, and are up and running. We have five stations in where there's construction in progress right now. And Burnside is one of those remaining stations that are named in the capital plan for us to make accessible in this current plan. Now, what I also said was that those remaining stations that haven't yet started construction at or haven't been completed yet are, are at risk because of our funding uh, uh, capital plan deficit and, and that 2.5 billion dollar hole that I mentioned we are all working to, to to fill but Burnside is currently one of those named stations in this capital plan for us to address and it is I would you know next on the list uh, well it is on the list for this current capital plan so so does that mean that there is a commitment to a construction start date like what are the what are the concrete pardon the pun um commitments for that station in particular or in general those stations listed in the capital plan so stations that are listed in the capital plan indicate where we're going next right what we plan to do this capital plan is construct is made up of 55 billion dollars most of which is state of good repair track work rolling stock things that we need to keep the system r running in addition to a, a significant amount for expansion and new new construction right so so this would be all part of that new construction right now i i mentioned to you we have eight stations that were either completed or in the works three five three fu fully completed five that are in construction and an additional seven, seven stations that are called out in the plan that we have not yet to get to. That means that those stations have not left the doors. We are committed to going there next. We are now working on securing the funding to, to package those needs and put them out for bid before con any construction is, is started. Thank you. Good thing. Any other questions? I do see a question in, in the chat. Um, Kim, well, if you will be able to share the the presentation. Um, I, I, I don't see why not, but let, let, let me check with our sure. PCR team. Wonderful. Any other questions before we wrap with the MTA? Going once. All right. Well, Kimwell, thank you. Thank you once again for being a part of our borough board this morning. Um, we welcome you anytime and it's so great to see you. Thank you for thank stopping. Thank you for by. having me. Cheers. Thank you.
Wonderful. Um, so up next, we have uh, the DOT that's going to provide us with some project updates and initiatives here in the Bronx. DLT. Good, good morning, uh, Deputy Borough President. Hey, nice to see you, you again. Great Keith to Kalb. See you. Hi, Keith. Keith Kalb, New York City DOT. I'm the interim Bronx Borough Commissioner. Uh, thank you guys for uh, having us today. I am joined for, by a few folks from my office. I'm joined by uh, Holly Malone from my office, uh, Jesus Soto from my office, uh, and Kevin uh, Perez from my office. I also have a couple of folks from our planning division downtown. I have Dustin Ku, our project manager uh, for transit development and uh, bus priority. I also have Alicia Posner, who is our deputy director of safety projects and programs for our research implementation and safety office. I also have Jesse Cabrera, our outreach coordinator for the bike share and shared mobility with us. Um, we're going to show you. Um, Oh, actually, I should show you my screen. That would help. Sorry about that. Can I just share my screen? Uh, can you see that? Sorry. Yep, yeah, you're all set. Great. Thank so you. we are here to uh, show you a couple of updates on some of the important work that we're doing here at the Department of Transportation in the Bronx, making uh, the city and the Bronx in particular a safer place for all roadway users. Uh, I'm going to start the slide. I'm sure everyone is familiar with the uh, Vision Zero, which we started as an agency in 2014, and we are continuing that work. Uh, I'm going to go to the first slide, which shows you uh, an overview of the Vision Zero mission, which is to eliminate all traffic fatalities and severe injuries on our streets. And this map here that you see is a um, map that we've identified using crash data for priority areas in the Bronx, priority corridors, and priority intersections. And so the basis of Vision Zero is to focus on these locations in these areas to provide safe transit options for all users, all, all transportation users on these roadways in the city. I'm going to, we have three projects we're going to show you and update you on. The three of them are ongoing right now and or in process, and we are planning to have them completed ideally by the end of this season, implementation season. And we are, I'm going to have to click through this, but the other folks are going to show you the presentations. Uh, Dustin is going to take it away now and show you an update on University Avenue. Dustin, go ahead and. Yes, hi, all. can you hear me? Hey everyone, so uh, as Keith mentioned, I'm Dustin Ku, project manager for the University Avenue project. So um, just a quick overview of the project, the extents of what has been constructed are on University Avenue or from the Washington Bridge to Tremont Avenue in the yellow here on the map. Um, and, and we just want to acknowledge that we do have an have ongoing extension of the project um, from Tremont Avenue north to Kingsbridge Road. So um, that, that is currently in progress. But for what's been completed, um, the street treatments include dedicated bus lanes, protected bike lanes, um, enhanced ADA accessible bus stops, sidewalk extensions, and pedestrian safety improvements, and um, other school safety improvements as well. So um, that was completed um, just a few weeks ago. And uh, estimated completion for the ongoing construction uh, north of Tremont is um, uh, end of fall of this year, um, uh, or or winter, um, early winter of this year. Next slide. Um, so uh, the, we at DOT identified um, some major issues along University Avenue, which. Cause which create which is what led to it being a high priority corridor. Uh, we observed low bus speeds, double instances of double parking, overcrowding on the buses, um, buses not being able to pull up to the curb, creating accessibility issues, uh, long stretches of the roadway without pedestrian infrastructure, and lack of protection for existing bike lanes. Um, so this is just some of the treatments that we implemented. Um, we put in a dedicated bus lane, um, protected bike lanes, accessible bus stop boarding islands, uh, sidewalk extensions, and various pedestrian safety imp improvements. And as part of a separate project in 2020, um, 
we at DOT also put in a new pedestrian plaza in front of the Morris Heights Educational Complex at McCombs Road. Um, and some, uh, a few of the project benefits from this project include um, increased bus speeds and reliability, uh, increased efficiency and ADA accessible boarding at bus stops, um, increased boarding area for bus passengers to wait for the bus, um, improve pedestrian safety and improve bike safety. And that is it for University Avenue and I'll pass it on to Jesse. Jesse. Hey everyone, thanks for having me today. Um, and just as a sort of quick overview, just in case, you know, I, I know our, our, our friends at, uh, at Community Board 9, 10, 11, and 12 are well aware, but for everyone else, just in case you don't know, um, uh, e-scooters as defined as state law are, you know, a device with handlebars, a floor, a floorboard or seat and an electric motor. Uh, by law, they cannot go faster than 15 miles an hour. They're not registered with the DMV and they follow the same rules and regulations as bicycles would. So that means uh, stopping at the reds, yielding to pedestrians, going in the same way um, as uh, general traffic. Um, and e-scooter share is sort of a collection of these shared um, uh, e-scooters that uh, the public can utilize. Um, so uh, they're all, everything is done through a uh, smartphone app um, where you can find, unlock, and uh, relock e-scooters. Um, their main point of focus is for point-to-point -point transportation. And um, this is just like an additional transportation option that we have um, here in the city. So specifically, if you go to the next one, um, uh, we have a pilot going in the East Bronx, um, and it's basically everywhere. E now it's everywhere east of the um, the Bronx River. Um, so this is a long timeline, but uh, you know the the e scooters became legal under state and local law, um, and the city council mandated us to conduct a um, e scooter share pilot. Um, so through this process with uh, with our request for expressions of interest, RFEI. Um, we eventually selected these three companies, Bird, Lime, and Vio, uh, to operate uh, our e-scooter uh, pilot. Um, so the pilot initially launched in the Northeast section of the Bronx in 2021. Um, and earlier this year in, in June, 2020, uh, 2022, it expanded uh, further South. So now the service area encompasses everywhere, again, East of the, of the river. Um, if you go to the next slide, we can see a picture of that. <clears throat> so this is the service area. Um, again, that phase one area is where we launched in 2021 and that phase two area is where we want launched in 2022. Um, the total uh, square mileage is 17.7 miles. Um, and this each scooter company uh, is allowed up to 2000 um, scooters each for a total of 6000. Uh usually we see that, you know, in the in the summer months they usually have more and then on the winter months uh they usually pare down um the amount of scooters they have. Um and last uh we have just some quick ridership. Um, Sorry about that. No worries. Um <laughs> uh, we have some quick sort of ridership. So uh to date there's been more than 1.3 million trips uh, taken for an average about for for an average about 3,000 trips per day, um, and uh, this map that you see here is a distribution on where people are generally riding. Um, so the darker the color is where most more more and more people are riding. So you can see there's a heavy concentration on, you know, the the areas along East Tremont um, in Throgs Neck, uh, a lot of Sound View, especially uh, Castle Hill. Um, is is uh, heavily ridden as well as in the northern section, uh, the Morris Park area and White Plains Road, um, and that's all I have, which leads into um, Alicia and an update about White Plains Road. Thanks, Jesse. Um, hi, I'm Alicia Posner. I'm the deputy director of safety projects and programs. Um, 
and I'm here today to talk about our project on White Plains Road. Um, as our, has already been mentioned, Vision Zero is a multi-agency effort in New York City to reduce traffic fatalities and serious injuries, and White Plains Road has been identified as a priority corridor for the Bronx, as well as having a number of priority intersections, um, which means that there is a particularly high incidence of severe injuries and fatalities on this corridor. Uh, next slide. Sorry about that. No, it's fine. Um, and to just provide a little bit more context, this project does include protected bike lanes and protected bike lanes have actually emerged as one of our most powerful um, crash reduction and injury reduction treatments um, for all users, um, not just reduction treatments. Um, for all users, um, not just uh, people cyclists or people on scooters. And so across all projects and then through an analysis, we found a drop in all injuries, a drop in overall pedestrian injuries, as well as a nearly 30% drop in uh, crashes where pedestrians were killed or severely injured and a 19% drop uh, in motor vehicle occupant injuries. So really powerful tool for crash and injury reduction overall. Next slide. Um, so White Plains Road, just to give a little bit of context, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. Um, it's a corridor that has an elevated subway structure um, over the roadway with columns in the roadbed. It has commercial and residential land use. Um, as I mentioned, the two and five subway service is located there with stations at a number of locations. Quite a number of buses that are also running on this corridor. Uh, it's a local truck route as well. And the project that we've been looking at, part of it was already completed between East 200 14th Street and East 226th Street. That was completed, substantially completed in uh, 2021. And then additional improvements um, are ongoing this year between Burke Avenue and East 216th Street, and also um, between East 226th Street and East 241st Street. Um, and I just want to mention that uh, we had the opportunity to include resurfacing um, with the work that is ongoing uh, in 2022. Uh, next slide. Um, so some of the conditions and issues that we saw when we were uh, working on this project, this is a somewhat unique location, uh, a uh, unique uh, situation, although present on some corridors in the Bronx where we have the overhead subway structure and then columns in the roadbed. And this creates what we call the ambiguous space between the columns and the curb. This is being used for a lot of different things. Um, it's sometimes used as a travel lane, sometimes used for double parking. Um, and all, we have pedestrians standing in this space as well. So it's leading to a lot of um, confusion about what the area should be used for. Um, also a lot of visibility issues for pedestrians as well as vehicles. And then we also have bus stops in the roadway. The bus stops on this corridor, uh, the buses are unable to maneuver to the curb. And so the buses have to stop at the columns. Um, people are waiting to board the bus in the roadway next to the columns. Um, and this is just an unsafe condition as well as being not accessible um, to New Yorkers with disabilities, as well as those with other mobility challenges, strollers, grocery carts, et cetera. And then we see a lack of bicycle facilities on the corridor. A lot of uh, people using the corridor already, as well as it being within the scooter share pilot area. Next slide. So we have been rolling out a very comprehensive project on the corridor. Um, in addition to uh, the protected bike lanes, as you can see, we have moved the curbside parking adjacent to the columns, created the protected bike lane in the north and southbound directions. We installed a number of new signals and pedestrian crossings, including at East 211th Street, East 215th Street, and East 228th Street, and all of those are currently complete. 
We also installed new bus boarding islands um, in the roadway at a number of locations. Um, you can see them there. Um, and this is part of our bus stop under the L program at New York City DOT to improve all and make accessible all of these uh, locations where the buses are currently stopping in the roadway adjacent to columns. Um, we installed painted pedestrian spaces at intersections where feasible, and we installed delineators as well as other vertical elements to encourage slower, safer turns um, and encourage vehicles to yield to pedestrians and cyclists. Um, here is just an overhead view of what the design looks like. You can see uh, the wide parking lane, which helps vehicles navigate around the columns, the protected bike lane, as well as turning treatments, the expanded pedestrian spaces to shorten crossing distance and improve visibility. Um, and also we have channelization in some areas to preserve access for emergency vehicles and emergency vehicle access. And next slide. And here I just wanted to show a few uh, progress photos. Um, you can see a photo of our in-house uh, team installing a new parking uh, metered parking facility under the L close to the East Gun Hill station um, between East 212th and East 213th Street um, with wheel stops. Uh, you can see our contractors installing green paint just south of East Gun Hill. Um, and then you can see a, one of the new bus boarding islands with pedestrians uh, or bus riders uh, getting off the bus on that new facility as well as some cyclists, as well as pedestrians um, using the new facilities. Um, yeah, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, everybody. Let me see if I can stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you to the DOT, DOT team. Any questions from Go George? Hey, thank you. So, um, uh, Community Board 12 is a beneficiary of bike lanes, um, and we are happy to have that because we felt that um, it would address one of the parking concerns that we had up here, which is double parking. Um, but I, I always raise this at budget consultations, and I was a little inarticulate, so I just wanted to raise it because I didn't have the statistics in front of me, but I do now. Um, the strategy of Vision Zero, um, since its implementation in 2014, you haven't solved and you started this presentation by stating that you're trying to solve the traffic fatality issue. Yet, we are at the same number and we're actually worse than last year. We're up 44% um, from, the, from the stuff that I read. And I'm just wondering, um, instead of doubling down and spending more money on this, maybe we should be exploring other options because I think you have some zealots at, Z at DOT that are really pushing this. Um, and I'm, I have no objection to bike lanes or some of the stuff that you do have done, but I do know because I've witnessed it because I do drive in the city, Webster Avenue, East Tremont, um, you're going to do it now to Gun Hill Road. You've done it on 161st Street, right in front of the courthouse. It is precarious in those areas because you've eliminated traffic lanes and you frustrated drivers to the point where they drive in oncoming traffic lanes or they drive in the bus lanes and they start. That's where, to me, I think people are, are standing in there and they may get clipped. I had a board member who had their foot run over. Um, they were never able to capture this person because they had a fake license plate, which calls into question a whole nother thing. So I'm just wondering when the numbers re basically remain static. I mean, we can, I have the, the statistics here in front of me, but from 2014 to 2022, the number has not changed dramatically. So I'm just wondering, is the agency looking at Vision Zero as something that's being implemented currently as being successful? Because I don't, I, I mean, how do you measure success if you're trying to reduce traffic fatalities and you've not been able to do that in the eight years that you've been doing this? 
George, you bring up a really good point. We have a challenge ahead of us. New York City is, at the moment, is car centric. We need to provide folks, and most of the folks in the Bronx don't own cars. We right now prioritize our streets for single use vehicles. We need to prioritize our streets for alternate modes of transportation, better bus transit access under the bus boarding islands, better bike infrastructure so that people, delivery drivers, bike commuters, and folks using scooters or other uh, multimodal transportation options feel safe on our streets. Until we provide those folks with facilities, nobody is safe on the streets. Um, our data is a little bit different than your data, George. We think from... Um, we think that we're going to get to zero at some point. I know that it's hard to change a culture of folks who, who are focusing exclusively on cars for our streets, but we have to start somewhere. We have to provide safe places for other modes of transportation, like I said. And I'm happy to talk a little bit further with you about the statistics that we have and 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 uh, the statistics, statistics that you that you're looking at. We can look at that a little further if you want in a separate well, meeting. No, I, I appreciate that, Keith. I mean, you've always been straight with me, so I'm, I'm that my criticism isn't of my criticism is basically of the strategy because what you mentioned is that's the rub. Manhattan and maybe even parts of certain parts of Brooklyn are different than the Bronx. For me to go food shopping, I have to get in a car and, you know, go to BJ's or go someplace else or Yonkers or whatever. And you have a lot of Bronxites who are homeowners that do that. You know, my parents back in the 80s and 70s were doing that. They were getting in their vehicles and they were going elsewhere. I don't know that you're going to be able to create that because unlike Manhattan, where you have a Whole Foods on every other block, you don't have that in certain parts of the Bronx. You have, you know, supermarket deserts in cer certain parts of the Bronx where people are forced to go and get in a vehicle because, you know, I I live in Club City. I have went from Pathmark or now Stop and Shop with a shopping cart. And, you know, I've had to make multiple trips. I'm a big guy. I, one shopping cart's not going to feed me so and my family. So I have to do multiple trips. Now I have an SUV, so I can just throw everything in the back. And that's the challenge. I, I'm just saying you guys don't incorporate these things for families that live in Queens, Staten Island, all these other things. Staten Island is a perfect example. I mean, that place is just vast, empty space. You're never going to create a situation where people are going to, you know, get out of their vehicles and bike to, you know, get food or stuff like that. They're just some things that people drive to. And I would hope that you would create, you would, you would focus on the people who are driver centric, like myself, make streets safer, not necessarily for pedestrians, although I, I, I think that you, you should do that. But I think if you make it so that drivers are less aggressive because of the changes that you've made, then, you know, you might have more success. People might be happier you know you, you you've implemented uh the 25 the the camera thing that's a start that's something there's other things maybe that could happen but again i think you guys are so focused on creating bike lanes and and these bus routes you've not sped up buses as a result i mean you gave us a presentation several months ago where i forget the bus on on 161 you were taking you were crediting a yeah, three six. minute drop in time as a success and to me that's not a difference maker for somebody that's weighing oh am i going to drive my car or i'm going to get to work three minutes faster but if i take the bus that's not a change maker so that's what i'm saying you should really start focusing on some of those things i mean i know i may be in the minority on that but i'm a lifelong bronze i i drive and you know i i've seen it with my own eyes people getting frustrated and doing stupid things on the road um, and I know my final point will be you make all these changes and you say that, you know, this is done to do something else. But then when we make complaints, you always say, oh, well, that's an enforcement issue. The NYPD needs to get involved. And I think that that's part of the problem as well, is that you have the NYPD not focusing on these issues. So, you, you, you know, you have a problem there that needs to be resolved. Thank you. George, I appreciate your uh your uh, forthcoming feedback. Uh, and again, yes, 
the NYPD, we do work closely with them, but and they are our partner in Vision Zero. So we will uh, make sure we reach out to them and let them know that there are issues. Great, I see uh, Sam, your hand is raised. You're on mute. You're on mute. Ah, sorry about that, y'all. Um, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Keith. Um, I know we talk all the time. Good morning, Sam. <laughs> I do have a couple of questions about Vision Zero. And I think as you brought up university, you know, we had um, a hit and run on the Grand Concourse last month. Yesterday, we had a situation on 188th and Grand Concourse where all the lights were out, the pedestrian lights were out, the traffic lights are out. Um, and so for our awareness, like what what is the process um, when these these updates and maintenance are happening? Um, because I was told by the contractor that the stop signs should be sufficient. The stop signs that are leaning against an orange cone on the floor that no one on the Grand Concourse is going to pay attention to. Um, so just well, I, that's the first of my questions. Uh, can let me address that real quick before we get into the second question. So the traffic signal that was out on 188th and the Grand Concourse uh, Thanks for bringing that to our attention. We dispatched the contractor to make uh, repairs immediately when it came to our attention. As everybody who's a driver in New York State knows, it's on the test. Mm -hmm. When a traffic signal is out, it operates as an always stop. And I know mm -hmm. the Grand Concourse is a very complex intersection, especially at 188th Street, just one block south of Fordham Road. And we understand that, but everybody should be driving carefully when they approach an intersection that is all out in all directions. Uh, same with if it's flashing yellow or red in all directions. Should operate as an always stop control. Um, the issue that's happening on the Grand Concourse, um, the Department of Design and Construction is currently rebuilding uh, the entire infrastructure along the Grand Concourse. And so I'm not exactly sure what the cause of the signal outage was on 188th Street at the Grand Concourse, but there have been some streetlight outages during the during their reconstruction of that corridor. And so you brought that to our attention last week and we had been working with them to make sure that all the streetlights along the entire corridor were operational. Um, and so we thank you again for bringing that also to our attention. Um, and so when the Department of Design and Construction hires a contractor to do the work, generally they are responsible for the entirety of that area that's under construction until the construction is handed back until the project is handed back to us as an agency then it falls back to us for maintenance and and uh and upkeep of that roadway okay um is there a protocol or like procedure i i hear you on a four-way stop right and right. i think in our mind in the council member's mind coming back from the event at, at, in just across the concourse um on a street as busy in the Grand Concourse, like does DOT have a protocol where they send flaggers? Like, is NYP traffic enforcement contacted? What's their response time going to be or supposed to be? And that might be a conversation we need to have with NYPD traffic enforcement. Um, but that was kind of our, our immediate shock because, you know, if there's a Yankee game, there's flaggers, there's traffic control. If you're down on Times Square, there's traffic control. And um, on a Vision Zero corridor, that just kind of felt like the most logical next course of action? Um, I can't speak for the police department, um, but if it's a high volume location, we would definitely reach out to the police department and ask them to send a squad car. Generally, uh, when a traffic signal is reported, traffic signal outage is reported to 311, they will often refer them to 911, report it to 911, and 911 will dispatch a vehicle, uh, you know, a police vehicle if possible. But I can't speak to what their protocols are and what their priorities are in each precinct. Uh, ideally, that would be um, sufficient. The DOT does not go out to every single street light that gets reported into 311 that's out to flag. We do go out and have our contractor make repairs within a certain time frame uh, in order to ensure safety. And often when they are um, when they're out there, they put up the stop signs on the cones because it would be ridiculous for them to attach them to the poles because it, the priority is to get the signal up, back up and running. It would take another half hour to put up signs uh, at each pole 
for people to see. So they have portable stop signs that they are on cones in order to alert motorists. Uh, motorists should already notice that the light is out, so they should already be using caution. But then, you know, to take time to put that up at a higher level would be impossible. Okay. Got it. Um, last two questions. So it goes to the local precinct. There isn't like a Bronx traffic control NYPD unit. Um, there is no what? There's not like a traffic control. There, Like I know there's a traffic enforcement unit, but it goes to the precinct and not to that unit. I'm just trying to understand the like full process. I guess I'm, I'm not sure what, what the organizational setup of the police department is. Uh, but they do have a borough traffic unit. I don't know whether they, I don't know what, where they're out of, like if they're centralized or if they're in the borough. And so does but, DOT and that unit ever have like a monthly meeting to talk about when they're going to need enforcement support or like, what does that communication look like? So we meet regularly with the police department. With the okay. Okay. So, so we, the police department and the DOT meet all the time we have uh the 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 chief of of transportation for the de police department has meetings and we attend each borough or each each uh unit comes down to or goes virtually to a, a meeting with the police department pretty okay. regularly i'll i'll follow up with you offline cuz i council member sanchez has some concerns and just wants more eyes and traffic enforcement along the concourse particularly when it comes to flaggers and and traffic flow um we just need them okay. so at construction zones at construction areas there should be flaggers 100% if they're working in that area and but that or comes the, from the contractor or from the NYPD so the contractor would be required to do that and some contracts require traffic control agents they have to pay for them they have to pay extra for them in their contract oh okay and what does oversight from dot look like with that because when i showed up on the scene there was one person one lone person working on that intersection one a police officer one no just one elect person electrician from or a flagger one electrician no flag no literally one man in a truck trying to handle the situation on 180th and Grand Concourse for the two hours that I stood there. I mean, I'll have to look into it. I don't know what the, what the, I don't know if they, if the contractor was actually working at that intersection when the outage went out, they could have been, you know, the, we're talking about, you know, seven block stretch, right? Or eight block stretch, whatever along the corridor is. They could be working anywhere along that corridor. They might not have the flagger at every single intersection. They'll have it where they're working and where the lanes are closed. There was what? one man along the seven blocks, one person, one truck working on that single intersection, putting the lives of our Bronx sites um, in danger. So, and I, I know I've taken up a lot of time, so we can circle back offline, but that is, that is council member Sanchez's concern is like the flagging, the oversight and accountability for our contractors from DOT and making sure that NYPD traffic enforcement is coordinating with DOT on these vision zero corridors. We are closely working with the NYPD on enforcement for all the Vision Zero corridors. Like I said, we work closely with them if there are special projects and special initiatives. I know two weeks ago, we worked closely together about the uh, illegal parking along the concourse by several contractors, uh, and we had the police department out there giving out summonses to everybody, and that I think has subsided a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and so we'll continue to work with that. We, you know, we have a problem with the illegal parking in the construction zone where we're installing the protected bike lane as part of the reconstruction. And we've been working closely with you guys to try and get that alleviated. Thank you, Keith. Thanks, Sam. Thank you, Sam. Um, Tyreek, your hand is raised. You're on mute. Sorry. Sorry. Hey, sorry, I don't want to take too much time. I just wanted to um, uh, piggyback off Sam and definitely echo a note. Um, however, the council could be involved in these uh, DOT and YPD meetings. We would love to. Um, I'm sure it'll provide a lot of insight for our districts as well. Um, and I'm going to drop my contact to you in the chat too. I would love to have a meeting. Um, but uh, during a presentation about University Ave, also known as Edward L. Grant Highway, 
Um, I, I know you said that there was bus lanes, bike lanes, and that whole thing's been revamped for the most part, but uh, I didn't hear a, uh, any mention about it being repaved. Um, I heard that white, um, white plains road, uh, got, re uh, repaved with the update, but I didn't hear about Edward L. Grant. And I know that's a major, like truck, truck and bus kind of situation. And the roads get really bad over there and people opt to drive in the bus lane. People opt to drive in the bu bike lane rather than drive on the street because they're, I wouldn't even say potholes. They seem like craters, um, from just all the traffic and all the constant wear and tear of the 18 wheelers coming through to get on the George Washington. Uh, we can find out when the last time uh, EL Grant was repaved. Uh, that project we did a number of years ago. Dustin, correct me what year that was, 18 and 19? That was in 2020. 2020, so 19 and 20. We started outreach in 19, started the the implementation of 2020. Um, we'll check on the status of repaving that roadway um, for you. Um, as for university, there were some sections that we did do some resurfacing on. Um, but we can, if you have specific locations that are of importance to you, we can certainly take a look at it. Definitely. I'm going to put my information in the chat. I hope somebody can reach out to me. Great. That's all. Thank you. And we have CB9. Thank you. Um, I know earlier in the presentation, we were talking about e-scooters, and I don't know if any of my colleagues have had the same concerns, but at Community Board 9, we've been getting a lot of complaints about e-scooters being left in the middle of the street, blocking pedestrian walkways, um, the ramps, um, private driveways. Um, and so I did reach out. I know Lime was one of the um, the companies that we received a couple of emails about and they did let us know that they're going to be looking into um, additional ways to enforce but i just wanted to have this chat here um because i don't think that we're probably the only community board that's going through that and i'm um, just to inquire if there's any plans or any ideas on how to combat this yes actually we actually just spoke with community board 10 this past week actually last week about um the community board 10's concerns are very similar to yours and we are taking that information back and we will be making recommendations to the three companies in order to try and alleviate those concerns we know that there are there are some geofencing issues with their software on the devices and we are looking to upgrade have that have the companies upgrade that uh that capability on those e-scooters but we have not gotten there yet Thank you. The other thing I wanted to note is that I did hear um, from the Bronx River Alliance about how um, the e-scooters, they deactivate inside of parks. But sometimes, I guess, if people are taking the e-scooters into the parks um, and they get deactivated, they'll just leave them there. So there's been a couple of instances where e-scooters are left inside parks property, but then they're yes. locked. That's yes. the other thing I wanted to note. Thank but you. They're not locked. They just can't use the, elect this, the electrical part. It won't work. You can still push it. But... Uh, we are aware of that, and of course, this is a two-year pilot project, so we want all of the community boards to provide us all the feedback so that when and if we go to a permanent program, we have that information on record from from the communities at large so that we can include that in a permanent program if it happens. Yeah, and I just want to I just want to add that um, I've been working directly with the Bronx River Alliance because there was like, like you said, especially maybe recently, I'm a uh, bigger influx of, uh, of vehicles being left in, in Bronx Park. And, you know, they have my sort of contact um, information uh, so we can like regularly meet about this. So, um, yeah, I just want to, uh, you know, em emphasize that, yeah, we've heard the same thing and, and we're hopefully trying to find a, a better solution. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Any other questions for DOT? Oh, Ralph. Thank you, Madam Deputy. Keith, good morning. How are we doing? Good. How are you, Ralph? I'm well. Thank you, Keith. You got a lot on your plate here. You know that, right? You know, yeah. Let's talk about three projects. I want to just uh, bring up something because I know the item on the agenda is, is projects initiatives going through the borough. I've been requesting for quite some time data 
regarding enforcement cameras, in particular on my bus lane here in front of my office since May. And I haven't received any data, but my concern is um, the deterrence that if it is any, because there's still folks driving, you know, I understand road dieting, I understand bus lanes, bike lanes, you know, uh, a pedestrian safety, I'm all for it, but if there's no deterrent, right, if for folks to be uh, not driving on the bus lanes, what's the sense of having it? You know, George brought up a fact of a three minute, you know, a uh, three minute improvement on my bus, the, the six bus. I don't see it. I don't see it whatsoever. And I need to be a law abiding citizen and I got to drive in the proper lanes, but yet everyone is driving on the bus lanes. I don't know if there's a deterrent being set by your office. I don't know about these red light cameras, speeding cameras, like can there's data, can you provide data per community board? Like how much of this, you know, I know it goes to the Department of Finance, right? Everyone's sending them, send you the summonses and stuff like that. But is there any data that you can provide to show that this is actually working? Because right now, I don't think it's working in my district. And I have this bus lane that causes traffic from Southern Boulevard all the way up to Westchester on 163rd Street. And folks get, you know, upset and they start driving in the bus lane. And I don't, I don't see a deterrence being set for this. And I've been asking for data on your agency's enforcement with these cameras for quite some time, and I haven't gotten anywhere. That, yes, I, Ralph, I appreciate your patience with us getting that data together for you. We are, our transit development team um, is working on getting that information together, and we will have it for you soon. The, as far as the bus enforcement, bus camera enforcement, information. The um, red light camera and uh, speed camera data I provided to the boards, I believe during the uh, budget consultations earlier this month. Um, if you did not get a copy of that, I will get you another copy. Um, we'll get you, what was the third, what was the other question? Oh, that's, that's mainly it. Yeah. I mean, I just want to make sure that is actually happening because I, I don't me, we get calls. It, enforcement is happening. We get calls all the time. People angry about getting a bus bus camera, a bus lane uh, summons, or a red light camera, or a speed speed enforcement uh, camera. We get Keith, the calls. If you wanna, if you wanna send me the location, Keith, I can um, look up the speed or um, bus camera data to see if we have um, hundred data. I can send you one hundred and sixty third between Westchester and Southern. Okay, thank you. Yes, correct. Perfect. Thank you. Any other questions? I know we're short for time, but one final one. And Sam, I do see your request in the chat. Um, my colleague Marisol will will take note of that. Thank you. So thank you once again, DLT. Thank you, Keith, for being on and, and being patient with us and, and for your wonderful presentation. Looking forward to inviting you to more of our borough boards. Thank you for having us. Uh, and I put my uh, email in the chat. Tariq, I'm, gonna, I'm already starting to send you an email to get my information. Uh, if anybody else needs my information, most of you uh, have my information. Uh, Feel free to reach out if you have any other questions or concerns. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Borough President. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have and I know day. you rushed. You rushed in from the previous presser, so we we, we appreciate your your speedy um, response and quick turnaround. Thanks no problem. We, we I spent the morning with the Borough President and uh, Commissioner Rodriguez uh, cutting the ribbon on a uh, beautiful protected bike lane along Bronxdale Avenue. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you and, and the rest of the DOT team. Thank You're you. Appreciated. Great. So we have a, uh, well, make it quick. Is, is there a question? No? Okay. Oh, that was, I thought okay. that, was me saying, <laughs> that was me saying goodbye, but. Goodbye, yeah. So <laughs> Great. Um, so we have a, a 
five more minutes and, and so we'll be quick. We'll open it up for any announcements from any of um, the city agencies that have any updates or any announcements. Nope, nope, okay. Any of the community boards? Oh, I, Tyreek, you can feel free if you have any announcements. Oh, uh, this was just a little cute announcement. Our office is going to have a, 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 a hunted house for the kids at Reverend T. Uh, Wendell Foster's a new community center located at uh, Reverend T. Wendell Foster Park, formerly known as Malali Park. It's going to be September 24th. I'm going to be dressed up. You all should come. 4 p.m. Come for that. <laughs> Thank you. I know CB2 might have an exciting announcement for this weekend. Saturday, October 22nd, we have our 37th annual Halloween parade. We're expecting at least 6,000 participants. We have drum bands and bands coming from Delaware down to DC. Uh, we invited uh, a whole bunch of folks. We have a social media influencer, Radel Ortiz. I don't I know. I saw that. Radel <laughs> Ortiz. He's the host of our uh, parade this year. Um, and it's going to be very exciting. It kicks off on Simpson and Westchester at 12 o'clock. Uh, the theme this year is Mardi Gras. Um, you don't have to be dressed in a costume. Um, it is very family oriented. We are encouraging folks to come out with their kids uh, and seniors for that matter. Um, and we have a stage at the end. Like I said, we're expecting 6,000 participants. We're having uh, awards for costumes uh, ranging in, in age groups. Um, very exciting, 37th annual Halloween parade. We're the second largest Halloween parade in New York City. And we take a lot of pride in that. So thank you, Madam Deputy. Absolutely. We'll be there. Any other Hello. announcements? Hello, Madam Deputy. The, uh, yes, go ahead, Mike. Yes, um, I'm sorry if there's noise behind me. I happen to be on our transit system as we speak. But um, in your offices, uh, in the community boards and in our elected officials' offices, you may see more foot traffic regarding rents that are going up. One, because the vending pieces were uh, approved. Another reason is because for individuals who have not contacted us through the pandemic, they will see their rents rising in the coming months. So we just wanna, again, remind you to, that this is coming and you can help your constituents to be proactive. But if you're finding that maybe staff needs a little more, uh, they maybe need a refresher or training, please reach out to us. A, if you need us in the community to do outreach in this regard, there's a way to you, for you to um, request an outreach event. And perhaps some of you might want to train a, a staff of uh, elected officials that work closely together. We'd be happy to train you as a group. We can do it remotely or in person. We just want to make sure that you guys are prepared to address any type of rent related, rent freeze related or homeowner tax related issues that come to your office. The applications are pretty simple and even new staff members can be um, efficient with uh, getting this information and resources to your communities. So please reach out to us if you need the assistance. We're here for that. Thank you. Thank you so much, so much, Michael, and we will definitely take you up on that offer. Um, I see DCWP. Yes, good morning, everyone. Very Hi. quick. Um, hi, I'm Melvia. I'm the Director of Community Affairs. Um, I just want to let you know that we finally have a community associate for the Bronx. I know the Bronx has been <laughs> for a long time without a direct point of contact from us. So I will be introducing her next week via email. Um, and I'll send, uh, she will be participating on the next meeting as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Elvia. Any other announcements? All righty, really quickly, I'll run through um, the Bronx Borough President's list of announcements. Um, as many of you know, October is uh, Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and we still have the Bronx Borough President's Office in collaboration with the DIVA Council, our Domestic Violence Awareness Initiative. Um, we're still 
rolling out events all month long. So we have a, a series of events in the coming weeks, a, a total of four. Um, and so if anyone's interested, I will drop the link to our DV um, awareness events for the month of October. Additionally, today, our office participated in the NYC Go Purple Day to bring awareness to the high rates of domestic violence and gender-based violence in our borough. We were stationed at three different train stations, Park Chester, Gun Hill Road, and 161st Street. Um, and these were in partnerships with the precincts that have the highest number of DV complaints in our borough. We also partnered up with uh, the mayor's office and CCHR to share DV resources. And so I encourage you all to still take part of our upcoming events. I just dropped the link in the chat. Um, so for more information, please visit our website, bronxboroughpress.nyc that gov slash events and you'll get the list of upcoming events for the month of October. Um, additionally, uh, October, uh, well, now we're commencing the end of Hispanic Heritage Month. And we, with that, we are hosting our annual Hispanic Heritage Month celebration tonight. Um, and that'll take place at Bronx Community College from 6 to 9 p.m. at Colston Hall in the lower level. Um, the exact address is 2155 University Avenue, and we have an amazing guest speaker. So come one, come all, amazing food, music, um, and just a celebration of, of the beautiful contribution of the Hispanic community, not just here in the borough of the Bronx, citywide, statewide, and nationwide. Um, and this Sunday, we have our annual tour of the Bronx. Um, I believe there are still tickets open. Um, my team is look at, looking at me a little sideways with that one, um, but it's our annual um, bike ride touring the beautiful borough, of course, our borough of the Bronx. Um, feel free, um, Mara, so if you can drop the link to ilovethebronx.com, um, there might still be some slots open this year. We are doing a 25 mile um, uh, bike uh, race, well, not a race, but tour, a uh, 25 mile uh, bike tour um, with different um, stops uh, along the borough. So please join us. It's, I'm gonna be riding, the borough president will be riding, um, our staff will be around as well. So looking forward to seeing you all um, with your bikes and helmets. Um, additionally, also this, this, this Sunday is the annual breast cancer walk. Um, it'll, it'll be taking place at the Bay Plaza shopping center. Um, and that I believe, um, Marisol, if you can drop the link to that, but I, I believe that that one's also open, um, to folks, uh, to all residents that want to be a part of it. Um, and then, uh, Halloween events we have, um, in addition to CB2's annual, uh, the following week, if you still have some energy in you and some costumes left, we also, in partnership with council member Kevin Riley, have our, the Halloween parade, October 29th at 12 p.m. Um, this event is gonna take place at Co-op City, section one, in the section one Greenway. Um, we'll also share that flyer as well with you all. And on that same day, if you don't want to walk the entire par parade, we are also partnering up with Councilmember Riley, the YMCA and Catholic Charities with the trunk or treats. Um, so folks will be delivering fun treats out of their trunks and that should be um, exciting and fun as well. So looking forward to seeing you all in costumes. And if I don't recognize you, let me know that it's you. Um, and uh, for the month of November, um, you know, this this month just flew by, but we all know throughout the month of November, we get together to celebrate the accomplishments, culture, and history of the Puerto Rican community here in in our in our state and in our borough. And so our annual Puerto Rican uh, heritage event will take place November fifteenth um, at Consofritos at six p.m. The flyer is still. Uh, being worked on so once that's once the details are ironed out we will share it but please put a hold for november 15th it's going to be fun again filled with amazing food music and we are um honoring some folks that have been uh extremely instrumental uh to uh you know the the development of of our borough so come one come all and excited to see you all in all of these upcoming events Great to see you. And so right on time, 12.02.
I have still two minutes from y'all. Um, once again, thank you to the presenters that were on this morning, DOE, MTA, and DOT. We are truly appreciative of all the information and the new initiatives that you shared with us this morning. Looking forward to our continued collaboration and thank you all for your thought partnership and amazing questions. See you all next month. Be well. Have a great weekend. You too. Bye, everyone. Good afternoon. Stay well. Take care. Thank you.